So the fifth class of Hobby Aizen is going to be all about building the actual website finally. Within this class, I'm going to be going over everything that you will need to know to get your website set up and to start loading your content onto it. This is also going to include a brief lesson on the advertising for the website. Although more in-depth tutorials on the actual plugins that will be used within this particular class are available in links in the guidebook during the advertising portion. With that said, if you do not have a copy of the product style plugin and or the Combozon plugin, you are entitled to a free copy of that through this particular course. If you do need a copy of these, please send a ticket to ryanstevensonplugins.com forward slash support and simply mention that you are part of this class, mention the plugins that you need a license for, and we will get a link out to you as quickly as possible. So as I said before, this class is all about setting up the actual website. There are going to be certain portions here that I may not go into excruciating detail about, but at least the important parts I will be uh, putting a lot more focus on. There is a lot that I'm going to try to cover in this particular class for you though. So with that said, I will go ahead and uh, get right to it. The first part of this is going to be getting the website itself set up. What I'm really talking about here is the domain name, getting your website hosting running, and ultimately getting your software on this particular site. So this would be WordPress and then anything that you want to use along with WordPress, like a theme and various plugins. The first part of this, the domain name and web hosting, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about this. Most likely, you have probably set up a website before. If you have not and you need some kind of additional explanation about some of these parts I'll be talking about, um, I welcome you to contact me through the support ticket system I was talking about before at ryanstevensonpluginscom slash support. And you can also find this kind of information fairly freely around on the internet. The important bits here though is the domain name itself. My domain name I have chosen EdenCPs.com. As you can see this is a pretty short domain name. For anybody that is into carnivorous plants and has really ever looked up anything online about them, they know that CPs is a pretty common abbreviation for that industry. So my domain itself isn't really targeting a particular keyword phrase. It's what I would call a branded domain, but I am still making this branded domain relevant to what my website is ultimately going to be about. So Eden could kind of be considered the branded part of this domain name, whereas the CPs part is relevant to what my site is about. Whenever possible, go for a .com domain and go for something that is as short as you can find it. If you can find something under about 10 to 12 letters, that is going to be your best bet especially with this kind of a website where you want people to remember your website name. You want people to be revisiting this website in the future. So having something short and catchy and relevant makes it a lot easier to remember. When you get your 
website hosting account set up. This could be a brand new account or this could be an existing account that allows you to do add-on domains. All you really need to do is find out what the name servers are for your web hosting account and enter them in wherever you have registered your domain name. I have this particular domain registered through GoDaddy and you can see the name servers here I have set for this website already because this site is already up and running. So if I wanted to change these, if I was just now setting up the website, I would just come in here and click on manage and set these two different name servers to the values that I get from my hosting provider. If you're not quite sure where those are, if you look at your welcome email that you get when you first create your hosting account, typically it'll have these name servers in it. You can also contact your web host and they will provide you with this information if you're not sure what it is. So once you get your domain set up and you point it to your hosting account, the next thing you need to do is to proceed on to the software. Again, this is something that is fairly basic and straightforward and chances are you may have even done it before but I'm still going to give you at least a, a brief walkthrough here within your website you should have access to a control panel typically this will be your domain name followed by a forward slash and then the word cPanel that'll reach get you to uh, the page that you see here on my screen or something similar to it most of these cPanel installations will have some kind of a way to quickly install common types of software. One of them being WordPress. Sometimes this is through something called Quick Install. Other web hosts will use this Softaculous Apps Installer. They all work basically the same way though. Once you get into these, you're just looking to proceed through the WordPress installation process. The important part is that you make sure WordPress is not going to get installed to any directory. So I just want to clear that out and have it being installed to the base domain name. Then you also need to set up other information for the site, such as the name and the description. These are things that you can go back and change later though. You also have your, your administration account. I would recommend using a username other than admin and creating a very long complicated admin password for your admin account. Again, you could go back in and change the password later on, but changing your admin username uh, requires additional plugins and stuff to do it. So with that said, the rest of this stuff is really optional and so there's only a couple of steps needed before you're ready to install. As I mentioned before, I already have mine installed so I do not want to actually complete this installation process at this time. So now this gets me down to my initial settings for this site and also getting the additional software installed which will be the plugins and the theme that I want to use for this website. The settings, there's really only a couple of them that you have to worry about. Once you get into your WordPress administration, just go over to the settings sidebar and go to the general page and this is what you see here on my screen. The site title and tagline, these values were set when you installed WordPress but if you need to go back and change them, this is where you would go to do that. The title is really just going to be the name of your website. So mine is EdenCPs.com. I have called my site title EdenCPs. The tagline, I want to give a short summary of really what this site is about. My site is about carnivorous plants and different kinds of growing guides for these plants and so that is what I have set my tagline as. To a certain extent 
you're not only summarizing your website here, this is also a good place to kind of insert some primary keyword phrases that you might be trying to target on your site. Pretty much any kind of keyword that I want to target on my site will relate to this particular keyword phrase right here, carnivorous plants. And so this makes sense to have it in the tagline because this is going to be showing up on every page throughout my public website. Next up, we have the writing page. Now, I have this particular list here. And uh, I'll be providing this list to you guys in the class materials section. This is the update services that I recommend using. Basically, whenever you publish new content on your website, it's going to notify these different websites that you have new content. And it simply helps to get your website indexed faster. And this is the most recent list that I use on the sites that I build. The next thing I recommend on doing is going to the discussion settings page. Depending on how you are going to be building your website, you may want to completely disable comments. That's something that I typically will do on WordPress websites, simply because WordPress gets targeted by a lot of comment spam. I'm also trying to encourage discussion on this stuff in my actual Facebook group. So I don't really want the conversation to end up split up in two different places. However, the way I'm going to be building my website is actually using nothing but WordPress pages. And so with the WordPress page usage, you don't have to actually worry about comments. It's really just for the post system. So if you're following the way I teach to build the site and just using pages, you won't have to really worry about this, but I still thought it would be worth pointing out. Simply unchecking this particular box here, allowing people to post comments on new articles will prevent people from being able to create a comment on anything new that you create on the site. But if you have existing content, you need to close down that stuff. I will go on here and set this to closing comments on articles older than one day. And that's going to close any of my previous content down. So between those two settings, it will take care of existing and future posts that get created on this particular site. Next up, I have the permalinks. I simply want to check post name right here. This is going to ensure that when people are viewing pages on my public website, that the URL will end up looking like this in a way that will make sense instead of having meaningless numbers or other types of information in the URL. This simply determines how WordPress allows access to your content, and this also has to do with search engine optimization as well, because the titles of your pages that you create end up getting created as the URL. This simply helps when you are trying to target various keywords within those page titles. So these are the basic settings that you have to worry about. It's nothing too complicated. Beyond this, the next thing is the actual theme. This is what's going to control the look and the overall design of the website. I recommend using a theme called Weaver Extreme. To find this theme, just go to Appearance and then Themes. Click on Add New. And then simply search for Weaver Extreme. And then install and activate this theme uh, directly on the page here. Once you get it activated, you're going to have Weaver Extreme admins show up 
under the appearance menu just like you see here on my page. However, um, before you actually dive into using this particular theme, there is an additional plugin that uh, kind of works alongside of it, but you have to install it separately. My notice is already gone, but up at the top of the page, if you go to this admin page that you see that I'm on here, you'll see a notice at the top talking about installing these additional plugins. And the one that you're really after is one called Weaver Extreme Theme Support. Look for the little link that says that in that message up at the top of the page and click on it and you can actually install and activate it directly from that screen. This simply adds additional features to the theme and some of these features are needed to do the things that I'll be walking you through here. The first one, and this is something that you can't actually do without that plugin, this is setting a sub-theme. This allows you to pick out a generic look and feel for your website by just simply browsing through this list, figuring out which one you like the best, and selecting it and clicking on this set the selected sub-theme button. Personally, I like to use 2011 Lite on a lot, of, a lot of my websites. On this particular website, I went with plain full width just to make my site occupy the entire width of the web page. It's a little bit of a different look and feel, but ultimately, um, there's not really, you know, any functional difference in pretty much any of these. So the one that you go with can really just be a matter of personal choice and preference. Just try to pick something that makes your content easy to see. Uh, there are certain ones with transparent backgrounds, for example, like transparent dark right here. I really don't recommend themes like this. It makes your content really frustrating for visitors to actually try to read. So beyond that, simply select the one that um, you believe to look the best. Beyond that, there are a number of other options available within uh, this particular theme that allows you to tweak the various settings that the sub-theme is going to set up. Depending on which sub-theme you choose, though, it can alter which of these settings uh, might be turned on or off or set to different values. For example, all of the color designs that are predefined in a sub-theme, they can all be modified after you set your sub-theme by just simply clicking on one of the colors that you see here and changing its value. So with that said, there's really no one predefined way for me to teach you to go through all of these different settings to kind of fine tune them. It's really just a matter of looking at your public website, especially as you build more content on it, and simply asking yourself, you know, is this the way I want my site to look? If you want to change different aspects of it, look at the tab that's on the top here. This represents a main area of your website. We have sidebars, we have the header, menus, content areas, uh, the footer. All these different areas represent a certain part of your site. And so if you want to change the way it looks, you just go to these tabs and look for the different settings that are available. Try different things out. You can always revert your settings back if you don't like them. So with that said, there are a couple of general settings that I typically recommend to take care of, no matter which uh, sub-theme you actually end up selecting. 
The first of those is under sidebars and layout. If you do not want to use any sidebars, if you want to have the full width of your website available to you to add your content to and to not have that you know, skinny sidebar running on the left or the right side, then this tab is where you can define that to take place over all of the content that you create on this site. By default, the blogs, posts, and the pages that are on the site will have a right sidebar set on a decent number of the sub-themes that are available. But again, these values can change depending on which sub-theme you picked. For mine, it was on sidebars on right. So, to eliminate the sidebars, I just changed this to no sidebars content only. So no matter what sub-theme you pick or what the default value is, if you change it to this value here, you're not going to have the sidebars. And so you'll get a lot more um, width to work with as far as uh, your content goes. On this kind of website where you're going to have these more in-depth tutorials, I feel like this is more important to have this extra space. And then you simply utilize the menu at the top of your site and also linking within your actual pages to connect all of your content together. And that's what a lot of my code generators are for that I will be getting into in a little while here. The next thing, over on the header tab, by default with most of these themes, you have a large header image that's going to show up. You can see them up here at the top of uh, most of these pages. In most cases, you're probably not going to have some kind of a large logo or graphic to put in an area like that. And the default options available here for you are really not that great. They're probably not going to relate to the website that you're building. And so on most sites that I build, I actually just remove this header image and I just let the, the title and the description of my website speak for itself. I allow that to be the header of my site. So to do this, I'm looking for this header image subsection here. And I just want to hide the header image by selecting hide on all devices for this option. The next thing that is worth pointing out for pretty much every website is the footer tab. By default, you will have this notice showing up at the bottom of every page throughout your website that says that your site is powered by uh, this particular theme. It'll even say that it's powered by WordPress. And to hide all of that information, you simply click on this checkbox here. This is all the way down at the bottom of that footer tab again. Now, something that is optional is that you can actually specify what you want to show up in that area instead of that powered by statement. If you do not specify what you want to show up there though, it's going to create a default um, copyright notice for your site. It'll look just like this, the part that I have highlighted here. It'll say copyright, it'll be the little C with the circle around it symbol, and then the current year, and then it will have your site title, and it will link to your homepage. That's fine to use, but if you're going to have a fairly heavy amount of Amazon advertising on this site, Maybe you don't want to create a standalone page that will talk about your affiliation with Amazon. 
this footer is a good place that you can include your required Amazon notice. Simply stating that your website is a participant in the Amazon Associates program and that you earn advertising fees by um, linking to Amazon. This is something that you need to have on your website at least somewhere, but by putting it in your footer, you're ensuring that it shows up on every page of your site, and there's definitely no question in Amazon's mind as to whether or not you're following that rule when you place it in your footer. So I have this particular statement here that I recommend pasting in to your site copyright notice and I have provided this statement in the actual guidebook for this class as well. All you would need to do is simply modify the domain name and the two places that I have the site title within this statement. So you can see my domain right here. So this would link up to your domain instead. And then we have my first site title right there and then the second occurrence of it right here. So just replace that with your own information and then you can reuse this exact same site copyright title just like I am using. Now as I mentioned before, all of the other settings that are available for you here, they're kind of optional. If you don't like the way something looks on your site, just hunt down the setting that is responsible for it. Chances are you can probably change it in some way based on one of the settings available to you here. But the ones I have talked about are kind of the recommended ones for everybody, no matter what sub-theme you have decided to go with. Now, I'll get back to this one here in just a few, but under Fonts and Custom, you also have this handy little custom CSS rules box. You can put custom CSS coding here to affect the design of your website. This is something that my code generator will be taking advantage of. And so I simply wanted to point out that this is the place where you would go to paste the CSS coding that my code generator provides for you. Uh, you can see this is my code generator. I'll be getting back to this in just a few. But by simply selecting everything here, um, you actually don't have to include the style tag that is both above and down below it if you are pasting it into this particular box. There are multiple ways that you can add this CSS code to a website. So by pasting all this stuff here, I would add all of the needed coding from my code generator. So then any of the HTML that I generate will display properly. So at some point you will need to be entering that CSS code into your site. The next thing that we need to worry about is plugins. You can choose to use a variety of different WordPress plugins. However, I recommend no matter what you decide to go with that you try to use as few of them as you possibly can on any one given website. The reason for that is whenever you load a plugin and you have it activated on a site, the code from that plugin has to be processed essentially every time a page is accessed anywhere on your site, whether it's on the administration side or on the live public side. So the more plugins you have activated, the more of this bloated code you will essentially have to run. And it just makes your site slower to load up, and that can in turn affect your search rankings. So the fewer the plugins you use, the more efficient your site will be and the faster the pages will load up and the better chances you'll have at getting good search rankings with your content. So with that said, I have just five that I have loaded up on this particular website. Three of them 
are free plugins. One of them I already mentioned, the Weaver Extreme theme support that goes along with the Weaver Extreme theme. Another one, WP Socializer, is simply for inserting share buttons on my website. So that takes care of this stuff here. SEO Ultimate is a plugin that I use to simply allow me to um, set some relevant SEO information on my sites, like the site title, um, the individual page titles, the page descriptions, and it even allows me to kind of do some social media targeting as well. I can specify the title and the description and even an image that will be used if people decide to share my content on Facebook, for example. So these three can all be found by simply clicking on Add New and searching for them through WordPress. The other two, Combos On and Product Style, are my commercial plugins, and again, you guys get free copies of those. If you did not catch it earlier in the class, if you need a copy of either of these plugins, please send a support ticket to ryanstevensonplugins.com forward slash support. Just simply mention you're a part of the Hobby Azon course and uh, mention which plugin or plugins you need a license for and we will get that stuff to you. So simply go through and get all of these plugins installed and activated on your site. Most of these are going to kind of take care of themselves or we will get back to uh, using these particular plugins later on in this particular class as we go through and build this website. So at this point, we have the bare bones structure set up that would be needed for creating pretty much any new WordPress website. Everything beyond this point is more specific to creating the actual content because WordPress can ultimately be used in a lot of different ways. Um, no, Karen, um, I'm, I don't usually address questions during uh, the classes, but this is um, a good one. She asks, I'm not, if, so I'm not using uh, Extendazon, for example, um, one of my other plugins at this particular point. I actually have um, like 10 different commercial plugins that I have developed, and I don't necessarily use all of them on every single website that I create. It's really more of a case-by-case -case basis of thinking about what will work the best, what kind of content and things like that and functionality do I need on this particular website. Product style is the, the basis of basically any of the Amazon advertising that I do. I'll have product style installed on, um, I actually can't think of any of my Amazon sites where I don't have it installed. So that's kind of what I use for my basic ad creation. It can also do comparison charts. Combos on, I actually don't use that particular plugin on every website, every Amazon site that I create. The reason why is because Combos On is more about bundling products together. So if I don't have a logical need to bundle products together into one single advertisement that I could put on a specific page of my site, then I won't use Combos On. For this particular type of website, it makes sense 
because my tutorial pages will often cover a number of different types of products all together that are needed to do this one single project. And so I can bundle all that stuff together using Combazon to put one relevant ad on a page that somebody can click on and immediately go to Amazon and buy everything they need for that project in one fell swoop. So with that said, any of my other plugins that I'm not using on this particular site it's simply because I don't have a direct need for it. Um, Extendazon is something that is really more useful on, say, a website where I want to kind of emulate a, a store. You know, I'm not necessarily going for that kind of a feel with this particular website, and so it's just simply not a plugin that I'm using. Again, it also goes back to simply uh, trying to use as few of a number of plugins as possible on any given website. Just use the bare minimum of what you need to get the job done. You can always go back and add more in later on, but it can sometimes be hard to kind of backtrack and remove functionality from your website once you build it in. So. Um, I start small and make sure that the website is running efficiently. If I see the need for something later on, I may uh, add it in. With your own website, just simply think about, you know, what you're trying to go for and, uh, you know, use the plugins that are relevant to you. They may not be the same ones that even I'm featuring in, in this particular tutorial, but these should be the plugins that would apply to the vast majority of hobby websites that you would be creating for this class. So again, that's another reason why I'm focusing on these particular two for uh, this series at least. So with that said, I want to jump into content creation now. We have previously talked about content creation, at least the writing portion of it in the last couple of classes in this series. So at this point, when you're ready to build your website, you shouldn't have to actually do much in the way of writing, if any writing, because you should have these articles already created and ready to go. If you are outsourcing your content creation, you just simply get your articles in from uh, your writers and load them up on the website yourself. The first kind of content that I want to talk about tonight is the project page. Ultimately, the different kinds of content that I'm going to be going through for you this evening are really not that much different. They all have the same basic steps to creating it, but what I actually put within the content in terms of uh, custom coding especially, that's really what differentiates one page from the next. So you'll see this kind of a focus here as I walk you through uh, these different types of pages on the website. So the first of them, the project page, what we are going to do is start with our basic article. We want to then add in HTML code to this article to spice it up a little bit, to make it something that is more attractive and easy to read through on your public website. Then we are going to add in any media, so this would be things like our images. And then finally we will uh, fine-tune the page settings before actually publishing this content on the live website. So with that said, if I go to pages here and open up a particular uh, page that I have on this site, I'll go for the do-it-yourself air conditioner page. This page 
as you can see, has some large sections of content in terms of just plain text writing in it. But then I also have some areas that have a lot of custom coding done to it. This is how I transform just a plain text article that I've written out in a notepad into being something more flashy like what you see here on my screen. Where I don't just have a plain article, I have uh, this custom built menu system here, for example. Going deeper into my article, I also have other various design elements that help to break up the page and for it to not just be a plain text article. So it makes it easier for people to read through it, to scan through the information that I have available for them. It also makes it easier for search engines to really figure out what my content is about because I've organized here all of the content on this page into these different sections and they can immediately be jumped to by simply clicking on one. So all I'm really doing here is jumping farther down a really long and complicated page that I have built on this site. So how you go about taking the plain text article and transforming it into this without really having much in the way of web building or, or even technical knowledge, that's what my, my code generator here is all about. I mentioned previously that all the CSS coding right here needs to make it into your website. Um, I have instructions on how this actually gets inserted into your page using uh, Weaver Extreme or also Weaver 2. I also briefly walked you through a place where this could be um, where this could be done uh, previously when I was setting up the theme. There are a couple of different places that you can put this code though. For example, the place that I mention here in these instructions I'm within the Weaver administration area here. I go to advanced options and head section and within the head section here, this very first text box on the site, you can actually paste the code directly from this box here, including all the style tags this time, into the Weaver theme. So it's only on that previous page uh, that I was showing when I first installed the theme that you would need to make sure you exclude the top and the bottom style tag. With that said, once you have that CSS coding entered into your site, you can utilize any of these code generators on any page that you want to to take advantage of these different design aspects that I've been pointing out to you. So, for example, um, the menu that I have at the top of the page right here. This menu is created using the content menu code generator. It looks fairly basic and straightforward, but a lot of the actual coding for this particular menu at least is really done within the WordPress uh, editor itself. All I have to do is enter in the menu code here and the header text here. So what I mean by that is this is my header text. Whatever I want to show up in this green box at the top of the menu, I simply copy that and uh, put that into this text box here. The next one is going to be my menu HTML code. The menu HTML code is nothing but a list. What I have done is 
written out one piece at a time what I want to be in this particular menu. So I started out with um, introduction to air cooling. And then the next one, water cooled air conditioner, and so on. So once I have my entire list of menu items, I simply want to turn them into a list. This can be done using WordPress right up above here. If you want an ordered list where the numbers will be counted out, right here, one, two, three, you would use the ordered list, which is OL. If you just want bullet points like you see here, then that would be an unordered list or the UL. So I select the entire list of the menu. I click on OL to create an ordered list. And then each individual menu item, I select it one at a time and I click on LI. And that's going to be each list item. So you can see that gets surrounded in these li html tags so this is a basic list here i've obviously done something a little more complicated where i have a list within a list where i have underwater cooled air conditioner i start another bullet point list to talk about subsections of this particular piece of my page so each of these menu items, this relates to a certain section of my page here. Water-cooled air conditioner, for example, you can see it starts with this section here and goes on down uh, to this next subheader. So all I'm really doing is taking my in-depth page, my different headers that I have throughout my page, and turning it into a list and then I'm turning it into a menu. For this uh, sub list here, if you'd like to try to do something like this where you have a numbered list and then you switch over into a bullet point list and then even switch back to it later, all I've really done to achieve that is within the number or the list item that I want to have a sub list for, I just start adding new content here. So I would do all of these list items, step one, step two, so on and so forth. Then all of this is turned into an unordered list and each of these items are turned into a list item. So this is going to give me number one and a number two, and then these two items will be bullet points of this number two item, just like you see in the top right here. So this is basically what I've created in my example here for you. Beyond creating the actual coding for it, the only other thing that you would really have to worry about is linking these different items to a relevant portion of your page. If you look up here in my coding, uh, my first one water-cooled air conditioner that I have linked up, you can see I have the water-cooled air conditioner text surrounded by coding for an HTML link. Within that link, this is the destination for that link. It's a hashtag, hashtag water-cooling. This hashtag actually relates to coding that is elsewhere on this page, further down in the content. So how you go about creating this stuff is also by using another one of my code generators. 
a number of parts of this uh, generator code. They'll be talking about an ID. Anytime you see the word ID here in all capital letters for any of these code generators, it is so you can turn those sections of your page into an area that can quickly be linked to. So for example, on my page here, where I have water cooled air conditioner linked to the hashtag water cooling, that is jumping me down to this section here, air cooling system powered by a do-it-yourself water chiller. This is actually the H3 header. This large green bar that stretches across the page Whatever text I want to show up in that bar, I put it here as my header text. And then whatever I want to use for my hashtag, I put it in as the ID. Except the one difference here is that I don't actually put the hashtag in for the ID. The hashtag is only used when you are creating the link itself. The IDs, though, they just use the ending of that hashtag. So by generating this particular H3 header, I take this code, I copy it, I paste it into my page, and that water cooling hashtag link is going to point people directly to this portion of my page. So that's what I have done here. This is what results from that code that you just saw me generate, this particular H3 header. So I put this in the relevant area of my page that I wanted to start the section on the water-cooled air conditioner. And then when I created that link, I just linked it up to that as the hashtag. So let me show you how you can create this link here. Just in case you're not familiar with all the coding aspects of it. Doing this purely WordPress based and using my code generator. All you have to do is highlight the word or the phrase that you want to turn into a link. You click on link up top here. And under the URL, you just put the hashtag symbol, and then you put whatever your word or your hashtag phrase is. And again, this ending part relates to the H3 ID. So that's what I had entered in here. You can see it ends up in my coding right here. And my link is simply referencing that piece of my coding. So by adding this link in, you can see I get the same thing that I had before, a link to the hashtag water cooling. So that is what I did for my page here, one piece at a time. I created various headers and created the links that would point down to them. Sometimes these headers would not necessarily be a large green bar. I have these subheaders that I use, and these are just, uh, they have a horizontal lines above and below the text, and all the text is put out in bold, all capital letters. This particular design here, again, is also covered by a code generator. That is my subheader code generator. It works the same way as the H3 header did, where I enter in the text that I want to show up, and then I have the ID for it so I can link up to it with my menu. So this allows me to create that hashtag link that I can point to it. So one piece at a time, you build up your menu 
that you want to have within your page for your project to kind of break it down into the different steps. And again, this is something that you could apply to pretty much any other kind of web page, any really long page that you wanted to break down and have these links that point to different subsections of that content. You could still use this menu uh, system that I've been showing here to you guys. So when you have all of your coding built for that menu, including all of your hashtag links within that menu, you select all of your menu code and that is what you put into the code generator under the HTML code. So this is my menu HTML coding right here and my header text again is what is in the green box. So obviously the menu here that I have is a lot longer than the one that I've created for this uh, tutorial but it's um, it's all the same thing it's just repeating that same exact process to create that entire menu you put it into the generator here and you click on generate and then it's gonna give you all of the code that you need to paste into your site just make sure you get all of it sometimes uh, this box can generate quite a bit of coding for you depending on on what you're generating so you select all of your new coding now and you take it back and it goes in place of that menu code that you were previously creating and so this is going to create that menu system uh, that you see in the corner of my page here so with that said I have already covered uh, the content menu now I have covered the H3 header and I have also covered the subheader a number of these other ones um, I'm actually not using on that same page I was just demonstrating I'm gonna pull up a different page here this right here this dual table setup that I have just to display some basic but also essential information having to do with my project I have temperatures and humidity levels that I'm trying to achieve with this particular project and so I feel like it's important that people are able to easily see this information so if you have some information like this that you would like to display in a double table format like you see here on my screen you simply use the dual table code generator now this has a bunch of different boxes for you to enter stuff into it's all fairly straightforward though um, looking at my tables here and then looking at the code generator I believe should help you to understand exactly what goes where so I've started up here at the top left of my very first table that I want to create I have the word day temps that is going to be header text one of the first table everything else I continue going down the table until I have nothing else to enter so I have the temperature here I would enter that in as table one value text one and then I jump over to the next column day humidity and I continue just like that all the way through the table to enter in these different values so whatever kind of content or information you want to be displaying within these dual tables just enter them into the relevant boxes here so now the last box that I have not entered in is my header text that's just going to be this chunk of text that I have showing up above my table and once I have all these values entered I just click on generate and I get my table text now if you're familiar with how 
table HTML coding works. It's, it's fairly basic in terms of HTML coding. Everything is broken down into uh, rows. TR stands for row, and either TH or TD stands for either table header or a table cell. So TH is a table header and TD is a table cell. So every time I have a TR tag here, that marks the beginning of a row. And then when I have a closing TR tag, that marks the end of one. So here I'm creating the top row of the tag that has my headers, day temps and day humidity. Right here, day temps and day humidity. So the next piece of this here is the information, the values of my table. 75 to 78 degrees and here again. So actually I think I entered in some duplicate values there for my text, but uh, the point here is that within any of these tables, you could add more rows of content if you wanted to by just simply duplicating the last row of the table. Make sure you get the starting TR tag and the ending TR tag and just duplicate those and then just manually modify what is within each of these cells. And you can have tables just like these except they would be as many rows long as you wanted them to be. Now another thing that I did for one section of this particular site, I had a lot of images that I wanted to display. I believe on some of these pages I ended up adding maybe 50 images or something like that to just one single page and so I had to try to think about ways that I could show these images in different designs because doing the same thing over and over again um, can simply get pretty boring and honestly showing large images the way that they by default got inserted into WordPress kind of like this uh, I believe what this was the medium image size. I actually did not have enough room in my content to fit all of the images at this size. And so that's where I came up with this particular listing of images. I call this the seven horizontal images or seven horizontal pics. And that again is another one of the code generators. What you're doing with this particular one though, again, you're just entering the image HTML code from all of these different uh, images. So you insert the uh, thumbnails for each of these images into your WordPress content. And then you end up copying and pasting all that code. I wanna jump into my page here and uh, show this to you guys so, so you can see what I'm actually talking about. Here I have each of my images that I want included. So I've gone through and I've added in my media one image at a time and inserted them into the page. I've included a caption along with each of these images and again, I inserted the thumbnail size for these particular images. So that's usually 150 by 150 pixels. So after I stack seven of these images on top of each other, just like I've done here, I then take all of those seven images together, copy all the code for it, and that's the code that I'm entering in here. So basically what's going to happen is this code generator is going to take that same code 
and it's going to wrap it in new coating that's going to allow it to be displayed uh, like you like you see on my screen or it, well like I was showing you previously this simply allows you to cram more images into a much smaller area but to still have them be displayed in a way that um, you know doesn't overcrowd things so now the last two here I have one called fraction and one called dual materials list Beyond uh, the home page menu, which I'll get to once I actually start talking about the home page creation in a few. Beyond that one, uh, these are the only other two that I have now not covered. These both have to do with the actual supplies and the list of supplies that I give people. Right here, I have a materials list and a tools list for this particular project. And I have the list on the same line, essentially. You know, they're right next to each other instead of being one list on top of the other list. To do something like this, this is what I refer to as the dual materials list. All you're really having to do with the dual materials list is enter in the header text and the HTML coding for only the second list that you create. So you create this first list right here within your WordPress content just like you normally would to um, generate a list like this. Just have all of your items one at a time. This entire thing Right here is an unordered list, so I just select all of the text in my content. I click on the UL button, and then one line at a time, I click on the LI button, and that creates this whole list for me. At the top, all I did was select my text and click on the B button, which just makes it into bold text. Again, that's within the actual WordPress editor. So then, all of the coding from that first list I leave it alone. I then create a second list underneath it just like I did the first one except now this is a different list for a different purpose and the coding for this list is what I want to actually put in the code generator. So the header tools list I would put in here and then all of the code for this list right here is what I would put in to this box. But again, this is not just the text that I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, the actual HTML coding. So with that said, you can see here is my basic list that I created one line at a time. I use the UL and the LI buttons to create all the list coding. For tools list, I just surrounded it in the strong tags. So this is my list coding now from the top of the UL to the bottom of the UL. I copy this and I put it in here and I generate. This now is what I'm going to copy and paste into my site over this entire list, including the header, all the stuff at the bottom. It's actually going to, at least on my site, it's going to be everything there that gets replaced by the content that was uh, created. So, again, that's how I generate my second list here. This just puts one list next to the other one. Now the final code generator, this fraction generator, this is something that may not apply to your website, 
But if you have some kind of a project like mine that involves measurements, especially measurements that result in fractions that you want to show people, you can manually write out a fraction, you know, one forward slash two can give you the one half fraction. But if you want them to actually look closer to what a real fraction should look like, and that's what I've used here on my screen, this is what the fraction generator does. For the fraction one half, I would just put in a one for the top numerator and a two for the bottom. And that will give me a fraction of one half. If I wanted it to be one half inch, all I would have to do is put the inch symbol on the end of it. So that one's just something kind of tiny that may not even apply to you. But if uh, you're dealing with a lot of fractions and you want to be able to display it and make it as clear as possible what you are referring to, especially if you have something like this, a whole number, along with a fraction, one and three quarters, it can sometimes look like 13 over four if you just write everything out. So it just makes the fractions a little easier to understand. So that walks you through all of my code generators except for one now. And I will get to that final one once I uh, move along and start talking about the creation of the home page. Before I do that though, I need to talk about your media and also the settings for these pages first. Any media that you want to add in to the page, images, videos, could even be audio, all of this needs to get loaded up through WordPress. I've done a variety of different kinds of media, even though mine is just pictures, Sometimes I show a large picture. Sometimes I will show these tiny thumbnails with this horizontal pics generator that I showed you guys. And other times I will just use uh, the medium sized image in WordPress and insert those into my page. The point though is that on these project pages, you can see scrolling down through this incredibly long project page here, the sheer number of pictures that I have helps to allow people to visualize what it is you're teaching them to build. Any of this media that you want to add into your site, it's pretty straightforward to do this through WordPress. You just find the location in your content where you want to put that image or media, click on the Add Media button, Click on Upload Files and just select the files from your computer that you want to upload to your website. Once you upload files, you'll see them displayed in this grid format like you see here on my screen. For some of the images that you insert, you may want to put a caption on them. So any of my images here where you see this italic text that is down below the image. This is the caption that I have set for that particular image. It's important to go ahead one picture at a time, click on the picture, get it to load up here, and set this information over in the right hand column for it. The most important of these are these top three boxes right here, title, caption, and alt text. If you're gonna use a caption, obviously you put your caption in the caption box. If you don't need a caption when you're displaying the picture though, you don't have to worry about putting anything here. For every picture though, no matter what you're gonna do with it, if it's being displayed on your website at all, make sure you are specifying both the title and also the alt text. 
these two boxes should describe your image essentially. It can be a great place to put keyword phrases, but also think about what this is truly used for. The alt text especially. If somebody is viewing your website but actually has a disability with their vision, they have screen readers that read a website to people. And so obviously when one of these things reaches an image, it can't figure out what that image is really about. And so what it does is it looks at this alt text and it will actually read this to the person that is viewing your site. Or if they have images disabled from being loaded in their browser, it will display this alt text in place of the image. So again, that's another reason why it's important to accurately describe what that image really is. But I also like to utilize it for search engine optimization to put relevant keywords having to do with what my image is really about, what is in the image, what am I doing, what products might be there. All these different things can be important to make sure you're including somewhere in this information. Beyond that, everything else is really just about how you want that image to be displayed on your live web page. If you want it to show up on the left or the right hand side of the page, you have this alignment setting or even if you want it to float in the center of your page. I utilize a wide variety of all of those, these different settings. This one is aligned in the center. Further down my page, um, this one is aligned to the right. This one is aligned to the left. And I actually alternate left, right, left, right, going down through a uh, pretty decent portion of this page. The, um, the seven horizontal picks is worth pointing out. All of these are left aligned. So for every single one of them, you would want to set them to left aligned. Um, link to, for most of them, I set it to media file. This way, if you're showing a thumbnail picture, it's going to link to the full sized image. And then finally, uh, the size determines how big it's going to be displayed. In most cases, you don't ever want to go over the large size. Large is about as big as really is going to fit within your WordPress website. In most cases though, I will use medium and with those uh, seven horizontal picks, I use thumbnail. So this is my setup for the seven horizontal picks, for example. I have a caption, I left a line, I link to the media file, and then I set the size as the thumbnail. And then finally, you just insert these into your page wherever you want them to be. Obviously I have my images inserted uh, already. But you can see when I click on any one of my images, I get a much larger image size. And in fact, I can even zoom in on these. I took these in a really high resolution pictures. So um, there's an incredible amount of detail. So people can actually look at my pictures and closely zoom in and, and even see like the plants that I'm showing in some of these pictures. This is not something that you have to do with your own site. It just kind of depends on what your pictures are really of. You know, do people need to be able to see that fine detail? Do they need to be able to zoom in? You know, if so, it might be worthwhile teaching, taking these high resolution images. This was just done with my cell phone though, just setting it to the max resolution it could possibly take. So at this point, we have set up all the different aspects of this page in terms of the HTML coding and the project media. 
The last thing we need to worry about are the page settings. And then we're actually ready to uh, publish. So you're simply taking your article, you're going through one piece at a time and designing it up with these different elements that um, my code generator puts into your hands. Then you're adding in the relevant media, images and things like that. And finally, you just have your settings to worry about. Now the settings, to start with at least, I want to mention the page title. You may have already done this when you first set up the page, but if you didn't, you know, create a page title that is unique and creative. Um, you know, don't just make it your basic keyword phrase if you're trying to target a keyword phrase on this particular page. Like on this page, I might just be trying to target Nepenthes Grow Chamber or even Highland Nepenthes Grow Chamber, but I've even expanded on that and put in words that are probably not going to help my search rankings any, but they might make my listing look more appealing to other people when they see this title in the search rankings or even when they see this title on social media, for example, if they see it in their Facebook newsfeed. Beyond the title, we also have the permalink. I really recommend to keep these short and sweet. Whatever your target keyword phrase might be, for example, might be what you set the URL to. So a lot of times I'll find myself editing these and any of the extra words that got added in for say this back part of it, I just went through and deleted those off of the end of the URL just to make it nice and short and relevant to what my page is about. Everything else that I want to do is down at the bottom of the page. You can see this is quite a large page. <laughs> um, pick at least one image that you think could kind of summarize your entire page. Each page that you're building of your site, um, at least for these project pages. Um, set this as a featured image. You can see I have a featured image set already on mine. There's a remove featured image link, but if you do not have one set already, this will say add featured image. And you just click on it, you select one of the images that you have already uploaded to that page, and you make that the featured image. Beyond setting that featured image though, the main thing I'm really interested in is this SEO settings box right here and two different tabs in it, the search engine listing and the social networks listing. This in a lot of cases will determine what people are going to see when your page shows up in the search rankings or when it gets shared on a social media site. So this one takes care of the search engine. This is the title and the description, which is basically just a summary of your page. The title, I just transfer from the page title down below here. Same with the social networks listing. I use the same title. For the description, I typically use the same description that I was using on the search engine listing. However, uh, the social networks listing description can handle more text than the search engine one can. Beyond those aspects, the final thing you need to worry about is this image under social networks listing. If you just click on upload image, you get shown all the images you've uploaded on your site. You can even upload a new one if you need to. So you just set a featured image just like uh, we were previously doing over here. I just make the same image in most cases, my social network image. That way, when people, again, share my page on social media, for example, they're going to get that information as their default information. 
there's my image, there's my title, there's my description. And uh, all of this was set in uh, that particular uh, SEO settings box in the social network tab. So all this information here was what showed up when somebody, you know, wanted to share that page. So this is really important. That way you can kind of control the information that, that people will put out there. When this is appealing, it makes it a lot more likely that, um, you know, other people will then see that share on social media and actually follow through and, and go and visit your website from it. So the next kind of page is a content page. Ultimately though, how you go about creating a content page on your site really works the same way that the project page did, except in most cases your content pages are going to be considerably shorter. Now, I have not actually loaded up any content pages on uh, my site so far. I really only have project tutorials on my site right now. I have um, these particular tutorials, which ultimately it's all part of one massive tutorial that I just split apart into three different pages. One covers the actual box building itself, another one covers the air conditioner creation, and another one covers the automated sprinkler system. But all together, they represent one single project. My, my content pages are really going to be more of, um, you know, for example, this type of stuff, where I go out and I visit um, a wild location of some of these carnivorous plants. This is one about 30 miles north from where I live. It's up in the mountains and these things just grow in little patches of soil that have accumulated along this river. And um, this here in the middle and all along in here are a bunch of carnivorous plants. So I might have a page where I just simply talk about visiting this location. I share a number of images. I maybe even share some of the lessons that I learned because I did some things when I was here, like I, um, I tested the uh, water quality, for example, of this water that is running down this river that's going through all of these plants. And so information like this, I'm not necessarily trying to teach anything specific, but I'm just providing useful content to my readers. Again, it would work essentially the same way though. I take my article that I have, I load it up onto my site, I go through and I add in my HTML code using the same code generators that I just got done demonstrating to you for the project page. But in most cases, you probably won't use as many of them. You might not create a menu on a content page, for example. You might not have um, a whole bunch of different subheaders and lists and other things of that nature. But you still may want to use a couple of them, like the H3 header, for example, just to break apart that content into a couple of different sections. Uh, for your users. A future plan that I have for my website, the bulk of where my content pages on my site are going to come from, and a big part of the reason why they're not really there already, is I want to have a bunch of different pages on this site that cover each of the different 
species of these particular plants. And while I could never really hope to cover all of them, because there's at least a few hundred different species of carnivorous plants, I want to cover the ones that I grow, at least. But not just give basic standard information about them. I want to kind of document my own plants over the course of time and, you know, do some experiments with them. Show the results of fertilizing versus not fertilizing. Growing with stronger versus weaker lighting growing in optimal temperature and humidity conditions as opposed to maybe just growing it on a windowsill. And to show the differences over, you know, the course of a couple of years of what happens to, to these plants under different environmental conditions. And so this is kind of a, a work in progress. Um, I have pictures from me growing these plants. I've been growing them for over a decade. But at least in terms of some of the things that I want to try to do, I didn't necessarily take the right pictures, you know, 10 years ago that I could then compare with a, with a current picture of the same plant and, you know, make any kind of relevant sense out of it. So a lot of this content is a work in progress and um, at least thought it was worth mentioning to you um, because it's kind of a, a separate side of my website. On most of these pages, I probably won't try to sell anything. You know, when I'm, when I'm just featuring a certain plant species and sharing pictures of it and things like that, unless there's a very specific reason to promote a product that maybe I used in, say, an experiment, you know, other than that, I probably am not going to have uh, a lot of ads on these content pages. However, you know, these content pages can really be pretty much anything. Pretty much anything beyond the project tutorials that, um, that we have already covered. So, if it made sense on your website to have pages that featured a specific product that you actually want to promote, you know, these content pages could be something like a product review page, but there are certainly uh, a lot of other examples of what these could actually be. So now, when you're creating these pages, the, the basics of it work exactly like with the project page that I just showed you. You add in your HTML code, you add in your media, and you do the same page settings that you saw me doing for the project page. So I don't believe that the content page at least warrants a uh, completely separate demonstration of how to assemble them. It's really just a more simplified version of the project page. So this brings me now to the home page creation. On my website, I have a home page set up already, and the main focus of this particular home page that I want to talk to you guys about in this series is this section right here. This is my home page menu that I have created for this particular website. While I call it the home page menu, I could certainly use a design like this on pretty much any other page throughout my website. The home page is kind of what I consider to be the main hub, the main category page of the entire website. It's going to link out to different sections of my site. And then some of those sections of my site might even link out to even more sections or even more articles of my website to give me kind of a hierarchy type of structure. Well, any, any main page 
throughout your website where you want to list and link up to numerous other pages, especially when all those pages have something to do with each other, this home page menu system can uh, work out quite well for it. Currently on my site, I'm only doing this on the home page itself, but as the site expands, I can certainly see myself using this same design in those other areas. For example, as I start to build out an area of my site that talks about the different species, I could have a menu system like this with each different species listed out one at a time, and each of these links up to that relevant page that I've created on my site for that species. So what I have done with my home page here, beyond just some basic text, talking about the website itself, maybe what people can expect from this website both now and in the future, pretty much everything else is just linking up to the relevant portions of your website. This is especially true with the way that I build websites. This is one of the main ways that people are able to discover the content that is on my site. So this is something that I find to be important. So for each different project tutorial that I create, I'll have a new section like this and then I'll link up to the main page or it could even link up to a number of different sub pages if I have you know, numerous pages that are all devoted to one subject or that all have some kind of a relation to each other. In certain cases though, I may not have multiple extra links down at the bottom. I might just have the main link up at the top in an image and a uh, short description. You know, I could easily cut this off right across here or so and just use this top portion of it just to say link up to another article that I post up on the page. So you can kind of mix and match and use this uh, home page design, you know, however you see fit. To get the coding for that home page menu, you go to this generator here. The home page menu, you can see that there are quite a few text boxes in there. Each of these though relates to a different area of this section here. So one piece at a time, I have the menu header text that would be right here. That menu header text is going to be linking up to a page. So that's going to be like the main page of this particular tutorial. So I just find that page on my website. I figure out what the URL for it is. I copy that URL. And then I add that in as the link URL here. Then I have my main image HTML coding. Note the part where it says HTML code. I'm not just looking for a URL here. I need the full coding for that image. That's pretty easy to get within WordPress though. Just add the media into your page temporarily and um, you know, get the the coding that is given to you for, for that particular image. So all I did here was I inserted a medium-sized image with no caption or anything into my page, and I got the image URL for that, along with all the actual coding that goes with that image URL.
So right here is the coding for that image. And again, this is just something that uh, originally I just generated from adding this media to my page. I just added the image and then just copied this image over uh, to get that code. So the same thing continues to work for uh, the different aspects of this page. These are the different links that this is referring to. Link 1, Link 2, Link 3. So you just enter in that information uh, that you want to show up there. So I have the image URL, I have the page that this link is pointing to, and then I have um, this read more link essentially, but you get to um, define the text. So this could just say read more. For mine, I actually used the word uh, read guide. Just to show you one of these here. For the first link text here, I have the title of that link. I have the URL that I want that link to point to. I have the image URL for the thumbnail. And then I have the read more text link. So I just do that same thing for each of those three different sections and go down below and click on generate to get all of my code. Now, I just take this code and paste it into my page uh, to get this, this menu that I have created for you here. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. A lot of copying and pasting into this code generator to um, create, you know, these, these different designs and things that I have done on my own page. But ultimately, I hope to have taken 99% or more of the technical side of it out for you and just allow you to focus on the actual content itself. So for my home page, I use that code generator to simply link up to the various tutorials and different kinds of content that I have created on my site. As I add more content, I can simply use that code generator more times and create more of these sections of menus for different purposes. Beyond that, I also have the page settings. However, this again is going to be um, basically the same thing that we have been setting for all of the other pages we've created. You set the, the title of the page. You don't have to worry about the URL for the home page though. But you do need to make sure you fill out all the information in that SEO settings box that I pointed out. So now, once you actually create and publish a home page, once you've clicked on the publish button that's within WordPress, there is one final thing that you need to do. Go to the settings and reading page of your site. And right here where it says static page, click on this bubble and under front page, select the page that you have just created and then save this. That's going to designate that particular page as the home page of your site. So then all of these menus that you're creating on the home page, that's what then connects people to the other areas of your website. Or at least this is one of the ways that they will be able to connect to the rest of the parts of your site. Um, 
The final one would actually be the main menu at the top of your page. I'll briefly get into uh, mentioning this uh, right before the conclusion of tonight's class in just a bit here. Before I get to that though, there is one final thing that I need to talk to you guys about and that is the creation of your Amazon ads. Now there are two ways to go about creating these Amazon ads or at least two different plugins that you can use that I've provided you with. One is product style and the other one is Combozon. I want to briefly point out to you how these work and how you can utilize them for this particular type of website. If you need more in-depth tutorials on these plugins though, please refer to the guidebook for tonight's class. I have uh, links to either a guidebook or an in-depth tutorial video for both of these plugins available for you in that guidebook. So with that said, the main method that I typically use to create Amazon ads is with the product style plugin. Once you get this installed and activated on your site and get all the proper settings set up for it, you can access this auto Amazon page under the product style menu and search for any product that you want to. So for example, I have this one product that I use called an icebox. This is part of my air conditioning system that I have created for uh, my growing chamber. This particular product, uh, you can see right here, it's just this little device and you push air through the large hole here and then these tubes right here, you run cold water through it. And so then when you pass the air through, it cools the water down. It's basically a radiator, but something that can be connected to a, a system that has an air duct. So this particular product is something that I definitely want to be advertising on my website. And so I can use the product style plugin to create an ad for it. All I have to do is click on a product. I just click on the name of it to bring up this window here. Before I create any ads with this plugin, I first need to create a category. On future products and ads that I want to create, I can reuse the same category though. But for this first one, I'll just call this like accessories or something like that because I'm not going to do anything too complicated. I don't need multiple product categories on this site, but there are some instances where it's helpful to use multiple categories. If you want to utilize comparison charts, any products that you want to be comparing against each other, you need to make sure they are in the same category. That's uh, one particular use of this system. For ads though, this category system is more of a memory system. Whenever you select a category, it's going to remember everything you do down below this point. So it's going to remember the product information that you have selected. And this ultimately is the information that gets displayed with your advertisements. So if I wanted to maybe show the price with my ad, I click on sale price and just check it right here. If I wanted to show the rating and the sale price, I check on both. If I want the sale price to be above the rating, I just sort them to change their ordering. Now I'm actually just going to use the sale price for uh, this particular example here. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom to the ad creation options. Here, I want to set my image size as medium. Uh, there seems to be an issue with the dimensions showing up correctly in this at the moment though, so ignore the, um, the dimensions shown in these parentheses. Typically these will show up correctly though. Um, 
focus more on the image size. The, it's either small or medium that you really want to use. Large will typically be much too big to use in an ad. I, I usually go for medium though. Beyond that, if you want to modify the default ad name, which also gets turned into the link text for your ad, you just modify these text boxes here. Um, I'm satisfied with the way that looks though, so I will just leave it intact. The last thing I'm going to change is this show special button. I want to make it show a buy now button, so I'm going to choose that from the drop down box. And finally, I'm going to click to create my product ad. So as you can see up here, it tells me that my ad was created successfully. Now in the future, if I want to create another advertisement on this auto Amazon page, having that category I previously did is going to uh, help me save some time. I can find another product. Uh, let's see, here's the one I use. This is a fan that I then have connected to that ice box and it pushes the air through. Well, to create an ad for this, I just choose my category again and you can see it automatically chose the same product information for me. It also automatically picked all of my options down here set my image size, set my buy button. It'll even set anything that's in these drop down boxes. It will remember all of those settings for you. The text is really the only thing that it's not going to be able to customize for you from one ad to the next. Um, depending on how you want these ads to look on your live website, you may want to end up changing the style. The style controls the simply the way the ads are going to look. And you can even go to the styles page and customize and create your own ad styles to be used with this plugin. For something fairly small and simple where you're not going to be showing a lot of this other product information, the ad only style is typically a safe bet to go for. So with that said, I've just created another ad here. And uh, I can now use these for a demonstration. I need to go ahead and reload this page after creating my ads just to make sure those ads actually show up um, in the system here. What I do now is within my content anywhere I want to create an ad. Let's say I want the ad to show up next to this text here. I just click my cursor wherever I want the ad to be and then I go up here and click on the PS button to insert that ad into my page. So I just find the ad that I created and click on insert ad to put that in the page. Now just to show you here what that has done, it has put this ad in my page right here. Not the best of locations, but I'm not exactly going to be leaving this ad here either. I'm just doing this for a demonstration purpose. So now, what if you don't want to show, you know, this big full-size ad with, you know, an image and the name and the price and the buy now button and all that other stuff? In a lot of cases, if you've been following this series and uh, the types of content that I talk about creating, if you have created a listing of materials for, say, a project, that listing of materials is probably going to have the names of a number of different products already in it. You could simply turn those names into a text link that then points to the Amazon website. So you get credit for any sales that you might refer on that particular product. Well, 
the product style plugin can also create these types of links for you, just plain simple text links. How you actually do this is by simply modifying this short code that was generated for this particular ad. For example, let's say I want to do a plain text ad. I'm going to add in the words, oops, sorry, add type with an underscore in between, you see right here. And then after that, I'm going to put in equals and the phrase text. Now, this particular part, you actually don't have to remember because you can easily generate a plain text ad also using this ad insertion tool. Before you insert the ad though, once you have selected it, look at this special ad type drop-down box. I can put in just a plain text link with this option here. Insert my ad, and you can see here it's going to give me a plain text link. Now, with this uh, plain text link set up like this, what's actually going to happen is whatever was used for um, in the ad as the text link previously, see this entire uh, title of the product, that is what will be turned into a text link by default. So if I just leave it like this and preview the changes, it's going to show me a pretty long text link. Well, what if I want to customize the text for that link? All I have to do is add a little piece to the short code, and this is going to be add text, and here I can call it whatever I want to. Whatever I want to be, whatever word or words I want to be turned into a link for this product is what I put in between the quote marks for this add text value. So I could just say Hydro Innovations 6 inch icebox. So you can see now that has changed my text link. So the text is now whatever I set it as. So using this particular tactic you can modify the materials list that is just plain text and you can turn all of these, at least the ones that you want to point to an Amazon product, you can turn them into Amazon links now and not necessarily even show um, images and things like that along with them if, if you don't want to. Again, it's just going to really kind of depend on what it is you're promoting, how you're promoting it. For these projects, I have a pretty big materials list. Some of the stuff I recommend for people to buy locally. For example, um, all the stuff here at the bottom of my list, I recommend for people to buy locally at Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot or something like that. Everything at the top of my list, though, this is all Amazon stuff that I recommend for them to buy, either because it's hard to find locally or because it's going to be cheaper to buy it on Amazon. For a situation like this where, ideally, when somebody comes to this page, I don't just want them to pick and choose one of these products and buy it. Ultimately, I would like people to buy all of them and to then go through my entire project tutorial and complete the project using all of the items that I told them they were going to need for it. So, 
for this kind of a situation, I think using my other plugin, Combozon, can actually be more useful than uh, just creating individual ads one at a time using uh, the product style plugin. With the Combozon plugin, what you can do is simply bundle products together. I've actually started the beginnings of a uh, cooling system ad where I can bundle all of these products together. You can see I have the same two products that I was just talking to you about before, the icebox and the duct fan. But instead of being one or a separate Amazon ads, they are one Amazon ad. And when somebody clicks on that Amazon ad, they're going to be taken to this page on the Amazon website where it's going to confirm that they want to buy these products together. And once they click on continue, it adds all this stuff to their Amazon shopping cart. So for this particular page, instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six separate links and telling people to, you know, click on each and to buy them all separately, I could put all this stuff in one single package. I still might leave these individual links, but then I can add one link up to the top above all of these lists and say, you know, click here to buy all of these products that you're going to need in one package. And it will simply um, make the process a lot easier and more straightforward for people. And it will also allow them to see a cost of the product up front. So um, I'm missing a couple of these products from my particular ad. The way Combazon works is similar to the auto Amazon page. You search for products and those products are displayed to you down below. When you find what you're looking for, all you have to do is click on the add button next to it. And it's going to add that product to your advertisement automatically. If you want to modify something like the text for this product, you just click on it in the ad, edit it in place, click on the save button, and it's been changed. So I just continue on through these different items now and add each of them to this combo ad that I'm setting up. So I'll add in this sensor now. Clean up the name a little bit. And the last thing I need are these two pumps. I need a 1,000 and a 400. All right, so now I have everything added into this bundle. There are different ways that I could display this though. Um, there's this option up here, add image display. You have many or one to where I can show all of these images within the ad or I could just decide to show one of them. And if you switch it, it changes it just like that. So I have one main picture and just a listing of the different products. If you want to change the uh, primary item, the, the image item, you just sort. Whichever one is on top, that's the image that is going to be used for that combo ad. And again, that's just if you're using the one image display. 
if you want to show them all, just use the mini. So this image, this entire advertisement now, I can put into my uh, web page, and then when somebody clicks on it, it's going to have everything all bundled together for that entire project ready to go, and it just simplifies the entire process. So when it's relevant, use combos on instead of product style to set up your ads, or even use both of them. So that's actually what my intentions are uh, with this particular website, is I'd actually like to use both. So I look for my uh, materials list that I have right here, make a little bit of space above it, and then I'm actually going to want to insert my combos on ad there. You can go ahead and update this page because that is definitely a change that I uh, would like to keep. Oh, I'm previewing my page here. There we go. I have my ad inserted in now. Um, obviously, my ad would probably be better designed with just a single image and not the multiple images. It, once you get a lot of products in there, it tends to stretch it out. I could also deal with having a longer description for uh, this particular product, just so it'll take up a lot more of this white space here. One other thing worth noting is that when you build an ad with combos on, let's say I didn't want to show this huge ad. Maybe I just wanted to have a, uh, a text link for it. If you copy the link location from this combos on ad, you can reuse that link wherever you want to as just a simple text link for that entire combo package. So another way that you can uh, utilize the plugin even if it's not necessarily in in the way that um, it was intended to be used. So this gives you a demonstration of both product style and combos on and also shows you uh, some of my recommended ways to use these especially things that might be a little bit beyond the standard usage of these plugins. Now finally, the last couple of touches that you want to add to this website is going to be simple stuff. Linking up pages together, this can be done in two different ways, your site menu or within the pages themselves. For example, my site menu, all the way up here at the top of my page, is just a simple menu that's going to point to the main areas of my website. As it expands, I might change this menu a little bit, but basically people should be able to navigate to every page of my website through this menu that's up at the top of my page. Not necessarily directly, they might have to click on a link that's in this menu, like they might have to go to this page. And then this page might link to a number of other pages. And so they can travel through links starting with this menu to get to everything on my website is ultimately what you should be going for. The other kind of link can just be a page link that is within your content. For example, with my... With my entire Grow Chamber set up here, I have a couple of subpages. The, the cooling system and the watering system are separate pages of my website, but I still link up to them from within the content of the main building guide here because they're relevant, because they're part of this entire project. So I kind of have these subsections. You can also just link um, normal words within your content together. For example, when I start covering different pages on the different species of these plants, 
whenever I talk about a plant somewhere within my website, like right here, I mention N. Hamada. This is Nepenthes Hamada. I could link this phrase to the Hamada page on my website. So I'm just interlinking my content together. So the menu at the top is kind of the main one you have to worry about to start with. Later on, as your site expands, be sure to interlink your content together. Now, to show you how to set all that up, uh, for your main menu, you just simply go to Appearance and then to Menus. Create a menu if you don't have one here already. I just call mine Top Menu, and then you just drag the appropriate pages. Check them, add them over to the menu. You can rearrange them. You can customize the text on the links if you need to through these boxes here. You can drag and drop things to rearrange to set up this entire menu for the top of your site. All you have to do is check this primary navigation box and that's what's going to designate this as that main menu for your website. After you save your changes then it'll be on your live site up at the top. One link worth pointing out here though that is actually not on my website is a link that I added that says discuss on Facebook. This link here points to my Facebook group for this particular page. So whenever I get traffic in from people sharing my content on social media or search engine traffic or something like that, I can take that traffic and convert some of it into members of my group. So they can end up going from my website to my Facebook group and joining my group and following along there. It's going to make it a lot more likely that I can keep in touch with and retain some of this traffic as my audience members. Because then on my Facebook group, when I publish new content on my site, I can simply go and let them know about it and drive traffic back to my website. So the, the other kind of link is the one within your actual pages. Um, I'll edit this one just for example. I actually don't want to set any auto links on these pages at this time, but I pointed out an example previously of where I might want to. Where, where I mention uh, the different species of the plants, for example, right here. These are some, it, just a small selection of species that would work really well in this type of a growing environment that I created. So I can link up each of these names to those pages on my website, at least once I create them. But instead of having to go back and edit this page and add these links manually, I can have those links automatically created for me. And this is done through the SEO settings box. Where it says links, all I have to do is add whatever I want to be turned into a link for this page. So let's say I was editing my Nepenthes Hamada page, which this is not, but I'm just using that as an example. If I add in the phrase N period Hamada as an inbound anchor link here, then when I save it on this page, this N Hamada phrase will automatically be turned into a link that points to this page that I am specifying the auto link on. You can exclude, which I recommend doing, excluding the actual page itself from having those auto links created. So that's just going to create it when it finds these phrases on other pages of your site and not this actual page. So that's just simply how you interlink your content together. You see websites like Wikipedia doing this type of thing all the time. You don't have to go and manually edit 
dozens or even hundreds or thousands of pages though to add these auto links when you're using this particular system. Now finally, it brings us to the last piece here, which is to tell your audience. And this is fairly simple and straightforward. Whenever you first publish your website and you get a couple of pages worth of content on it to where your site may not be complete, but it's complete enough to where it doesn't look like it's you know, heavily under construction anymore. If there's some relevant tutorials that people can go and browse, you know, share this stuff with your audience. Go and share a link to your homepage when you first get it started. But then over the course of time, you essentially want to repeat what I have been teaching you, not just in this class, but in the last couple of classes, where you're creating new content over time and then publishing it on your website. And then when you publish the new content, you go and you tell your audience about it. To where in the future, you're not just sharing a link to your homepage, but you're driving people to individual pages of your website as they're being built. This helps to keep your audience engaged with what you're doing, and it also helps to give you a nice boost of traffic every time you add in new content. It's a great excuse to go to your audience and let them know about it and to drive more traffic to it. So you can simply continue this process as much and as often as you want to to add in all the content to your site that you want to be there. You could decide to stop at some point and just occasionally rehash your content telling your audience about you know something that you wrote in the past or you could constantly be adding new stuff to your site it just really kind of depends on what your website is about whether there is a need for new stuff to be created on it say a year from now or five years or ten years from now for my site I could put a lot of the basic info that people would need out there in a short period of time and then just be done with it. But there are also some more long-term plans of mine that I've mentioned to you guys. Um, building up all those different species pages and doing you know, some experiments and, and documenting the results and showing pictures of the results to people over the course of time you know, gives me something more long-term to try to focus on for the site. But in terms of what you do on your website, it's really up to you. What do you think you'd be comfortable with creating? What do you think your audience ultimately would be interested in seeing is really what it's all about. Because if nobody's going to be interested in seeing it, there might not be a point in creating it on your website. So how large of a site you build is really going to be entirely up to you. But as you continue to update it, keep promoting it to your audience for new traffic, and then other traffic beyond that audience traffic will really come naturally, especially as you build more and more content, as more people share your content on social media and link to your content from other websites, you know, your search traffic will grow and grow over the course of time with a website like this because it's jam-packed with really great, useful, unique text and, and other types of information that search engines love. So you don't always have to constantly be promoting to your audience, but it's a really easy way to get everything started up and to add extra traffic to your website uh, essentially on demand. To get started, you just simply get your site set up. You add some of your initial content to it just to where, you know, your site's kind of, it can even be in the condition that mine is in right now where 
I have a number of content pages available. It's enough for people to look at, even though it's only covering one subject, really. And, you know, get your site to at least that point. Get it all finalized up before you start sending your audience to it. And then just rinse and repeat that process to add more content, content to it as, as time goes on. Now in the final class of Hobby Azon, which we will be running uh, next week, we're going to be covering um, more long-term information. You know, what, what else is there to do for this website? Is there any extra marketing and things like that that we could be doing for this site? What kind of long-term maintenance is necessary for it? Things of that nature we will be getting into in the next class. But as of this point, once you have worked up through uh, this class in the series, your, your website should be complete, at least complete enough to make it live and start driving traffic to it. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and open the floor to open Q&A for tonight. If you have any questions to ask me about tonight's class, uh, just simply add them in the chat box for me at any time.